wanted to welcome the inaugural session of the Organic Advisor Call Series, and I'm going to be your facilitator for these six calls. I'm Nate Powell Palm, and I'm the training specialist for OATS. I'm uh, also a farmer based out of Bozeman, Montana, and I raise a, a mixture of uh, cereal grains, pulse crops, and oil seeds. Um, this series is brought to you in collaboration with the American Society of Agronomy and the University of Wisconsin-Madison's O-Grain program. And then we also have OATS, and Mallory is our fearless leader on the OATS team. If you want to give a wave, Mallory. Um, and then we've got the folks from ASA and University of Wisconsin-Madison, as well as um, and I'm seeing if any of them are on the call right now, but shout out to all affiliates of University of Wisconsin-Madison, as well as ASA. Thank you everyone for joining us and really appreciate the collaboration here. This is the first of six calls we're going to be hosting in the series, and I would encourage you to visit uh, the OATS website to view the future call schedule and the list of topics we're going to be covering. The call series topics and guests are drawn from a video series recently released by Ograin and ASA, and those can be seen at the link I will chat to you all right now. And if you haven't done so already, I highly recommend signing up for the newly launched Organic Advisor Listserv. We'll be having some great conversations right in your inbox on all things related to advising organic grain farmers. And the link to sign up is in the chat. Or it will be in just a second. I sent it, Nate. Thank you. All right. So now to the good stuff. That's just the housekeeping. Um, so let's get started with today's discussion. Our guest is Ben Adolph, the owner of Merge Organics. And Ben is an Illinois certified organic farmer um, and a advisor to organic farmers. Um, and I will turn it over to you, Ben, to give a little bit of background. We'd be really interested if you could tell us about your path into organics, what your current operation looks like, and what your future growth plans are. Sure. Thank you. And, and thank you for having me on. And, and thank you to the group for, for coming into this call. Uh, so just to get into real quick on the farming side. So I'm actually not certified organic on the farm side yet. We're in transition on our own farm, but uh, we, you know, I transitioned 40 to 50,000 acres. You know, been a part of the transition about 40 to 50,000 acres through, you know, my work history and, and through some ongoing projects. Uh, soon to be more acres, I, I think, from, from that standpoint, maybe double that. But what, what we started out at as Merge Organics was just this that you know merge is the operative word there we were bringing all these resources into a central uh you know a central platform which was initially in person you know it was, it was a me as an agronomist as, as a cca it was me in the field it was consulting with brands and then deploying uh sustainability initiatives through organic food production down to field level and uh, we quickly changed that over into a, a software platform, which was Merge Marketplace. Uh, throughout COVID, you know, we launched March 1st. So throughout COVID, we made quite a few changes to that business model. To the farming side, my family farm was once large, has gradually become smaller. My dad is on his way out of the operation. Uh, it's unknown whether or not my brother continue in the operation, uh, just because we each have gigs outside of farming. and. Um, my gig is a support role in the organic industry, and, and I love it, and I think I'll always be here in, in some capacity, maybe the entire, uh, you know, my entire capacity at, at some point. But our farm is located in northwest Illinois, highly productive soils, uh, dealt with some generational issues as to whether or not we get to transition. Uh, you know, regardless of what I did for a living, uh, you know, to make, to pay the, hear that, yeah, yeah <laughs> see? I'm sure a lot of people can can hear that message, and it is a, it's truly a generational issue. Uh, I think, uh, you know, when we get back to the farm legacy side of it, uh, so struggled through that process until just recently being able to gain some headway on it. Um, but before that, I had a, a career with a company called Midwestern Bioag, and that's really where I initially stepped in, stepped back into agriculture. I worked in the human health side prior to coming back to agriculture. So I was, I was tied into uh, athletic development, athletic nutrition, 
so that's where part of this comes from is the, the drive for a, a more nutritious, more nutrient dense production system. Uh, and it, jumping into a company like Midwestern Bioway gave me a, a different look at, at the agriculture system than I was going to get with anyone else, nothing against any of those other experiences, but I was exposed to a completely different side of agriculture right out of the gate. So I think that really changed how I how I took in a lot of that information. And it was more focused on the biology, the soil health component. It was, it was a lot more focused on the regenerative space that we have today, you know, occupying that that dialogue, but at the same time, not considered regenerative agriculture at the, you know, that's, yeah, I think it was considered regenerative agriculture. We just didn't throw it around like crazy like we do now. So, so I learned a lot in that in in that role. I was director of sustainability for them prior to my departure in early 2019, uh, or I'm sorry, late 2019, very early 2020, and then uh, launched my own venture. So, and I think you know Midwestern Bioway has gone through a change of ownership in that time they're they're a different company today than they were before and uh, eager to see if they make progress in, in the direction they're headed but uh for our farm we're going to continue working down I, think, I don't know if any of you saw these videos yet but uh yeah I think we're, I had a chance I'm, I'm having a challenging uh, time yeah What's just I, I hope everyone saw them but I'll still ask some questions that kind of inform what was in the video as well yeah we I mean we had a challenging year through, through our first year of transition, I've gone through it numerous times with customers. We just have to adapt and continue forward. The, the difference is we weren't trying anything wild and crazy. So we know we know the mistakes we made and we know the issues we had, and we're going to continue to move forward on the you know similar pathway that we laid out early on. Thank you for that. I think the, the first thing I would love to dive into is, could you tell us a little bit about your work helping farmers transition. You mentioned tens of thousands of acres um, have been part of your, your work, getting that across the finish line for transition. How has it been working with farmers and what are some of the biggest concerns that you notice farmers had coming in and then ultimately your solution to those? Yeah, I think the key, and this is just generally where I've, you know, where I am geographically, there are a lot of, there's a lot of larger farms. And I think I touched on this in the video. It really is about the commitment from the farmer to get it and the commitment isn't some philosophical deal right it just comes down to optimizing your operating efficiency as a as a grower and for me i'm a small enough grower because it's less you know it is my heritage as a farmer i mean i'm fourth generation or whatever however that you know however these these all generations work so i'm, I'm embedded in agriculture um but at the same time it, it, it is a side project for me. So I'm all in right now. If I, if I had 4,000 acres or even a thousand acres, I would definitely not be all in until I knew it matched my operating plan. And that to me is one of the, is one of the issues I faced with my own data it was, it was the operating system, right? So as a farmer, we think about things in terms of tasks and we think on this, you know, this, I do this at this time of year, I do this at this time of year, I do this at this time of year. And I was watching, you know, trends from somebody like my dad. It was like, I plant corn, I nap. I might spray corn and I nap and then I harvest corn and then I nap. Uh, so like, it was two things, right? One of them was looking at, all right, how, how, how truly productive is the system where we just put seed in the ground and we pay for synthetic inputs? And at the end of the day, do we even produce anything of value to the community? Not likely, right? You know, we produce a crop that generates revenue for us as an operation that we can then take that revenue and transition into a community project or however we want to do it. But at the, at the end of the day, we didn't, we didn't devote anything to like the human nutrition or, or the, the well-being of the community around us or the well-being of, of nutrition as a whole. Uh, so th that was one factor. And the other factor was whether or not we were even farming. You know, it was, it was uh, for, I can tell you right now, I barely, I don't even know if I would consider myself a farmer based on my activities at the field level. So, um, so yeah, I, I think hear we're, you. Really, we're really focused on, uh, really focused on how that change can cross the generation. And it, and it comes down to the, you know, how, how, how we are thinking about our operating plans and the fact that we're going to increase our workload. We might increase our equipment load. We might increase the amount of time we have to spend in a tractor seat. And most farmers today that have been fortunate not to sit in that seat, don't want to get back in it, and they don't want to get in it more than they're already in it. 
So, yeah, that's when you're working with farmers and from your own experience, how does the, the thought process work that you've, as you've seen it play out for organics, allowing folks to look at spending less, ultimately retaining more value on the farm. You're talking about, we grow the corn, we pay for the fertilizer and the spray, and we're ultimately, you know, uh, a big revenue generator, but net revenue, I think is always something folks, we don't brag about net revenue at the coffee shop, let's say. It's all about about the bushels. And, and I think with organic, how have you seen that play out that it's a different model and something that needs to be communicated a little bit differently with clients? You know, that, that's the social restriction to organics, right? That's part of what everyone is afraid of is that coffee shop talk that your field looks horrible compared to the neighbor's conventional field and, and you won't yield as much and you might have a weed issue that you need to address. And that, you know, addressing those infield issues are, that comes down to whatever strategy you set from the beginning and, and you're following. But the social component of, of going into that coffee shop and having, you know, the conversation about net revenue, I don't know any organic farmers that, that have a discussion about yield because um, you know, it's not 300 bushels or, I mean, if you go into, if you go into any farm shop around my area, it's, you know, it's 250 or don't get up in the morning, you know, I mean, that's <laughs> corn, right? And, yep. and on the organic side, you know, we'll hit, you know, 200 to two, I think I had a customer with white corn in central Illinois do 235 bushels an acre a couple of years ago and on white corn, organic white corn. And, you know, you can talk yield at that point because that's a great yield for, for white corn in general, but now you tack revenue into that picture and mm -hmm. it doesn't take a whole lot of spreadsheet work to understand that when you make over $10 a bushel for a crop that produces over 200 bushels that you're making a lot more money than you would in the conventional space. Yeah. Regardless of yield, uh, the difference comes down to resource use efficiency. You know, if we look at look at organic producers and how they're growing that crop, there's a massive amount of resources that go into conventional production from from a from an input standpoint. You know, if we look at the fertilizer markets and the amount of the amount of movement required to get fertilizer on an acre, we look at that chemical, the amount of movement required required to get that chemical on an acre. Um, you know, there, there are big supply chains attached to those products, but in the organic space, it's unfortunately, you know, too much manure in that space, but at the same time, it's still, it's, it's a manure input. It's hopefully a, a secondary input of, of nutrients. Uh, so we manage it with a little more technical expertise. And then it's, it's a food crop, ideally, right? I think most organic producers like to grow the food crops. There's a little additional premium, but the reality is, is we're producing a crop that will be consumed versus a crop that will go into ADM and make an enzyme or make fuel or make, mm -hmm. um, you know, something that's in a processed product that we don't even want to eat off the shelves ourselves. So, so yeah. Absolutely. I, you, you um, prompted one of my questions and that was in your video, you mentioned, I think a great line of just because I think it was just because you can, doesn't mean you should. And especially as it comes to manure, could you speak a little bit to the um, the sort of the more whole ecosystem approach to figuring out crop nutrition when it comes to crop rotation as well as inputs and in organics that you found to be successful? Yeah, but, yeah, it it's a challenge because there's so many different production environments, there's so many different soil environments. Uh, you know, I mean, it, it just is not one system doesn't match all. All, all areas and that that's I think hopefully something that stays clear in this conversation is that what I do in Illinois I don't do in Denver you know or, or Colorado okay. I don't yeah <laughs> you know, I mean all that all no. that changes and unfortunately what hasn't changed is you know if, if I'm trying to produce you know 40 bushel wheat in South Dakota I'm likely limited on my input choices but a lot of those growers are still choosing a manure source from that standpoint if you hop closer to that manure source and you look at organic acreage, you're likely looking at an over application issue of it. Uh, so it, it has become manure has become this primary component of organic production. And I mean, the reality is, is it's, it's it, for me, it's, it's tied to two things that I don't like. It's tied to a toxicity issue that we have trouble with, you know, in the nitrogen game, because six tons of, of chicken litter to grow a corn crop is as bad as putting 300 units of anhydrous ammonia out there to me. I mean, it just is a, 
it creates a completely different media for that crop to grow in and it's, it, it becomes toxic over time. Uh, so as we look at these situations, we look at soil conditions, we look at weather conditions, we look at the you know regional access to things like manure, access to things like supplemental nutrition products, uh, supplemental nitrogen products. And then we take the whole thing into consideration as we look at production and, and you know, 40 bushel wheat doesn't need that many nutrients. It might just need a supplemental nutrient attached to it when you're in dry land production. And 200 bushel corn doesn't need four tons of manure. It needs a ton and a half of manure and a supplemental nitrogen source. You know, that that's how we would do it in the conventional side. Why wouldn't we do it in the organic side, especially when we have the margins to manage it properly? We don't have to just chase cheap inputs and poor management. So when I think about just uh, and this is, uh, you know, a, a result of a lot of supply chain issues. But uh, six tons of chicken manure is not cheap. It's a, it's a pretty pricey input. So it seems like the more we can think about growing nitrogen, growing our fertility and managing that fertility on farm, the more, you know, again, we have more profit and margin left on the farm. Um, in your video, you mentioned relay farming um, or cropping. And could you tell us a little bit about the crop rotation that you're using in transition and reiterate what the, what has worked, what you found challenging, and I've got a few follow up to that after that. Sure. So I guess relay would be a, a fairly new, uh, yeah. I mean, it's a fairly new practice that that has become more mainstream within the regenerative space. And um, for us, it made a lot of sense. We run highly erodible land. We run a lot of timber soil. You know, I, I, my part of the operation gets the stuff my dad doesn't want. You know the. Mm -hmm. The not you know the not that exciting stuff to farm so so we have highly rollable land uh very light soils and i don't want to grow corn i don't want to have to cultivate that kind of land so my solution was looking at how do we establish a small grain in the rotation while also establishing our leguminous crops like a soy which grows very well around here and, and we have uh, you know a close market for the organic soy and we also have a close market for those transition crops with the chicago market so we selected crops that we knew we could market during transition. Uh, we selected a system that we knew we could get away with with our equipment, with our, you know, with our harvest cycles. So we went with small grain and then we went with soybeans planted on 30 within those small grains. And then we had, uh, I think I had eight inches of rain from my planting date on my soybeans to uh, you know, when we harvested. So we had some severe conditions that we don't usually have around here. And the combination of that, those two crops in relay really suck the moisture out of us, but they serve their purpose, right? We had a great small grain crop, and then we had, uh, you know, a, a very much underperforming soybean crop, but at the same time, we had continuous cover. We came right back in and drilled our small grains this, this winter to go right back into that cycle. Um, we did a lot of things last year from an establishment standpoint that I'm not happy of. Uh, the small grain establishment, the cover crop establishment as a whole within these these systems is, is as important, I would argue more important than your cash crop establishment because we're using those cover crops for three or four things within our management process versus a cash crop, which is plant the seed, grow the crop, make the money. Mm -hmm. You know, that cover crop for us is functioning for tillage, uh, pest management, habitat, nutrient cycling, uh, um, among other things. I mean, there's, there's a list of, of those benefits that we're using them for. So, um, so yeah, I hope I am. Yeah, that, that I, feel, I can have you back up one second just to, so in first year of transition, are you putting down your, your fall planted rye and then going into a cover crop after that rye has come off the following summer? So from a revenue standpoint, with the way the markets jumped on soybeans, we made a decision to go into the relay cropping because I thought, you know, if I get 20 bushels to, to the acre of these soybeans, you know, and we planted soybeans early June, late May, uh, you know, that, you know, we, we made some mistakes and planted earlier into our wheat and then we lost our wheat window and we had our soybeans get ahead and we, you know, I, I lost three quarters of my soybean plant trying to clip my wheat because mm -hmm. I didn't pick a higher variety of wheat. So there, there were a lot of, yeah, there were a lot of issues with some of the decisions we made, but the, the, the real issue was that establishment, you know, that fall seeding. Um, you know, back to the importance of establishment, we put it on with an airflow because at the time I was just looking for a cover crop. So I thought, well, in case I go into transition on this parcel, you know, we're going to put 
two and a half bushels of rye on so i get a, a thick stand and then we didn't get a thick stand so yeah, yeah. and then like I, that from a soil contact point of view or okay yeah it, it was well it was, it was a couple of things right it was soil contact it was climate you know it was a late seeding because we were waiting on you know we're waiting on a service provider to get us the rye and put it on uh, because yeah you know, again i is it uh, farming would technically be considered my side gig right so it is when you're in that position you're at the mercy of people to support you with and those people are my input providers and uh you know i'm on the bottom of the list for a lot of things because of my size so sure yeah so yeah so it was a stat you know it was all about establishment seed to soil contact fundamentals you know fundamentals are so important to all of these processes and the fundamentals you apply to conventional also apply to organic and then you make changes to the to the higher level pieces but the, we failed on the fundamentals that's why we're doing it again you know if, if we failed okay. on something high level that was step 10 then we'd have a real thought process to go through like can we break that barrier but when we know we failed on the fundamentals it's like we have to do it again because we're morons you know we know the fundamentals <laughs> so so we have to replicate the system because we know what we failed on and we know if we don't fail on those fundamentals it'll work great sure so we had rye and then harvested the rye planted the soybeans got the planted, so the, no, planted oh. the soybeans into a green rye crop in okay. early, early june yep on 30 inches harvested the rye came back harvested the soybeans all right Same and so then the what and and what's your next move the yeah, the year after the fall after you've taken off the soybeans so we would harvest the soybeans and come right back with us with our cereal grain so okay and are you gonna do rye, rye again Okay. Yeah, we did, we have a great cover crop market for the rye. So uh, I think, you know, this year we were selling rye out of the bin for, I think, $10 a bushel and uh, delivering it to central Illinois where there's a huge demand for rye this year. So we delivered it down to central Illinois. They cleaned it and they were getting it out on the field, you know, still two, three dollars a bushel less than local price. So oh. it was a win-win for everyone in that situation. And, and we'll continue to do that until there's no demand for it. Great. Yeah. Um, after this rye comes off um, the following year, what's your plan? Is it going to be another cover crop or will you do soybeans again? I think depending on the, I, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, well, how do you weigh that? Like as an advisor, yeah. what sort of considerations would you take for, for making that decision? Well, I, I take this one a little more personally than I would as an advisor, because it is like, I, I'm, I've been on, this is my family farm. I've been on it forever and I know I don't want to grow corn. You know, if, if I was working with an with a farmer locally, it'd be like corn would be on the rotation because that's what they know how to do and that's all they want to do. So for me, I don't want to do corn. So I really have to look at what I can do on the small grains and, and uh, you know, pulse crop side. I, I've thought about uh, the yellow pea grows okay around here. The you know, soybeans obviously grow okay, but they're very tough to manage under my conditions of of lighter soils you know if I, if I don't get a small grain established there's no point in using that as a cover crop or a you know a rolled rye with soybean system if you don't have a good small grain established with your roll with your rye rolling it is just an activity it's not something that changes your outcome it's just sure. you know it's just a poor rolled rye crop at that point so we're going to keep establishing small grains and i i i've been looking at you know the trending weather around here we're, we're becoming drier and drier and drier so i think a hard variety of wheat would work especially under my conditions where we have um, lighter soils drier soils and you know i've been trending at least i would say five to seven inches depending on the year less rainfall mm. more rain events coming in bulk and then i dry out quick so i'm really thinking about bringing some hard red wheat into northwest illinois on some of my light soils because i have the ability to check try it out for one and number two i think it might it might work and that opens up a different price point for me and it also opens up a different crop on rotation so uh, so i think we'll try the small grains after this you know this second round of transition we have a question from joey and his question is how was the weed control in the relay system he mentioned that he did it on his conventional acres and ragweed just about ruined it yeah, did not have a, a broadleaf issue. I have a farm that is probably best to be pasture, you know, this, the, that, that caused me a lot of foxtail issues. Um, 
then I think that was my biggest issue was foxtail. I mean, if you look at my bean sample, it is like probably 60% foxtail and you know, the rest soybeans is not good. You know, I'm not happy about it, but I know where I failed and it was in my establishment, my small grain. Sure. Otherwise, if you look at where I had a heavy small grain presence, you know, where I had, you know, my one and a half million seeds per acre, my one and a half million plants per acre, mm -hmm. I had no weed pressure the entire season. Um, you know, and I had, um, within that system, I also had the best soybean crop. You know, so where I was competitive on weed pressure, I was not competitive against my soybean crop because weed pressure determines outcome at the end of the day. It's not, I think that's where everyone gets it wrong in this cover crop game. Cover crops don't compete unless you pick the wrong cover crops. You know, cover crops are complementary service to your cash crop. Uh, so it really did what it was supposed to do in those areas. It competed, out competed the weeds where we had a great establishment and it, it allowed our ca our cash crop to come through, but yeah, I can uh, I can feel the pain on that because where we didn't have a good establishment, it was a nightmare. Absolutely. Do you think that um, could you speak a little bit more to how you consider fertility? Um, if your goal is ultimately, I think you said in the video, try to hit when you hit certification, you're going to grow. That's when you're going to grow your corn crop um, to realize the best revenue. As you're building fertility during the transition, what are you taking into consideration? As we're building fertility, I'm really only looking at air and water management as my primary tool to build fertility. And that kind of goes back into my cover crops, but it also goes into my, I, I, we're a no-till operation. I should, I should say that too. We're a no-till operation on the conventional side. So my access to tillage tools and then to Joey's question, no, we didn't cultivate I think we got rid of our cultivator 20 years ago when I went, went to college or something like that. But um, so what we're really looking at is number one, how do we manage our air and water? Because, you know, we know from the agronomy side that if we manage air and water first, managing nutrients becomes, you know, it becomes a secondary activity, but it becomes, uh, you know, the primary uh, outcome of proper air and water management. So we look at air and water, then we look at how to bring in nutrients that have value to us, but also nutrients that we have to purchase, you know, from, from the organic side of it. So we do use some manure product. I would say we don't, you know, I'm a half ton of manure kind of person. And then I'll go get products like if, if I need to chase calcium, because I have very, uh, I, I, yeah, so I'm cut from that cloth of soil balance, right? So yeah, I see it. I've seen it. I don't, I'm not trying to hit a specific number, but I'm trying to supply nutrients that I know between how those chemicals act in the soil. Some nutrients suppress other nutrients. We have to chase some nutrients, even though the levels are high, they might not be exchangeable. So I come from that school. So I will apply secondary nutrients to the soil system. I'll apply some of my primaries in, in the form of a supplemental product, like a nature safe product. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a 961. So a 961 for me in a small grain environment is huge. I don't need a I don't need a potassium thing. I just need to know that I get my nitrogen supplemented and I get some phosphorus supplemented. So I have available N and P for these crops, and then I'll supplement some of the rest of them. But you can you can go through a lot of cash if you try to fully correct a soil system up front. You know, it takes a special mm -hmm. scenario for you to be able to look at your soils and say, I want to fix those first and then farm, you have to put a system in place that fixes it while you're farming. Um, we, we, we had come a long way before we transitioned. You know, we had gone from a very conventional operation through this transformation into uh, reductions in tillage. So we, we went strip till for a while. Then we went just, we're just going no till. Uh, we integrated cover crops 10 years ago when started working with cover crops. We, we integrated a completely different nitrogen management system. So my dad's one of the conventional guys that grows, you know, some of the best corn in the, in the area with, I would say half the nitrogen of, of most of the neighbors because of how he manages his rotation and his nitrogen system. So yeah, but the, but the bottom line, Nate, is that the cover crop, I think it's going to come back to the cover crop for me on the nutrient management, air and water management, pest management. I just, I put so much emphasis on that cover crop within my system. And now we look at the regenerative services and you look at carbon, 
you have to have the cover crop. So if the organic space wants to stay on track, they need to figure out how to better use the cover crop in their system. When thinking about the transition and our respective resources, like I, I really hear you saying that we want to not necessarily fix the soil, but put plants in the soil that are going to be our workhorses and ultimately get us where we want to go once we hit certification. Would you recommend growing corn during transition or is that just such a suck of nitrogen for a, not much of a premium during transition that you'd say hold hold on and wait until you hit certification to try that corn crop yeah easy it's a, it depends right it's an sure, easy sure. Answer, right so I, I would personally and i'm in corn country right so i would personally advise everyone against growing corn during transition because the only thing that changes growing corn during transition is really you have to cultivate and the weeds will just destroy your outlook on organic mm. if, if you go to corn in that first year and you take away all your tools. So uh, I really look at it from a, you know, the, how do we provide ourselves with the best chance to, to succeed? And we can turn wheat into that bastard crop of the rotation all we want because it's the lowest, it's the lowest revenue generating crop that we have. But the reality is it's also the easiest to manage. And, um, Anywhere I go in Illinois, I use kind of a dumb rotation, I, you know, but it's a lot of it is because of our market outlets, but it's also just because we're so used to corn and soybeans around here that we don't need to complicate that system. So we do corn, soy, wheat within our organic rotation, but during transition, I, I don't really see the need for corn other than to learn hard lessons, you know, same as soybeans. I mean, you put soybeans into your rotation during transition. I, I would start a transition after soybeans because I can go small grain, but yeah, my, my row crops in transition, I don't, I don't see you're going to gain any knowledge other than you'll find yourself in the seat of a cultivator a lot. You know, it's- Sure, that's, that's super helpful. Yeah. Do you think um, there's, well, I, well, you didn't mention this, but a lot of folks that I've talked to kind of around the country, if they have a market for it, see perennial legumes during transition as a real win, just because it sort of takes what you're describing, all of that pressure of weeds, pressure of tillage, and ultimately weed control, um, and puts it into, you know, one basket where you just hay off all of those weeds and ultimately realize a big nitrogen credit once you hit certification. What's your thought on alfalfa in in the corn in real corn country? Yeah, I, uh, the, the problem I have with alfalfa is it takes tillage to terminate, and sometimes that doesn't even terminate, and then it might persist for a few years after that. Um, but the I mean the complementary side of that in corn country is you also don't have a huge feed demand for alfalfa, so it's like all right, if we you know if if we grow alfalfa where we grow a lot of corn. It, it's a great way to accomplish our goals. If tillage is, you know, if decreasing tillage is a goal, then it's probably not. You know, mm -hmm. we saw that up in South Dakota with some bad press on on that farm, on the Gunsmoke farm. But there, I, I was part of that. So I don't know if that many people on this call know that I was part of that Gunsmoke process for a period oh, of time okay. because Midwestern Bioag was tied to that. But that was an operational issue. That wasn't a system issue. Now, I, I'm in that part of the country. I, I don't like alfalfa as a permanent crop in the rotation for transition because of what happened at Gunsmoke, right? Then becomes another management issue. Like it might fix a couple things, but when it's time to put a crop in there that generates your primary revenue, how do we get rid of that crop that got us through transition? And mm -hmm. when we're in corn country, it's for me, it's small grains. You know, we're ending we're ending our transition in small grains. We're coming at that small grain parcel or parcels with a diverse cover crop mix that manages our allelopathy. It manages our nutrient scavenging. It manages uh, it manages nitrogen additions, and then we go into a corn crop. So we have an optimal scenario for corn crop production in an organic system. So ideally, as we schedule that rotation, small grain, small grain, cover crop, you know, row crop corn with optimum, you know, nutrient base under it, you know, so it's mm -hmm. residual nitrogen from our cover crop, probably, you know, our nitrogen coming from a, a manure application, and then it's nitrogen coming from a supplemental. So if you look at that three, you know, that's a 
that's a split application of three different nitrogen uh, of nitrogen sources. It's three different times. It does a lot of the things we're trying to do in the conventional space, and it's not just four tons of litter um, and a bunch of tillage to incorporate it. Yeah, and then a bunch of tillage to manage weeds. Uh, you know, our goal in the organics, you know, within my organization and the organizations I'm a part of is to move the needle on regenerative systems in organics. It's not to create this regenerative organic piece, because I think that is a tall hill, you know, that is a steep hill to climb. But there's no reason we can't do a better job of integrating the regenerative systems into the organic space. You know, we can eliminate 75% of our tillage passes in organics with, with regenerative services. You know, we can increase diversity, uh, you know, micro and macro diversity mm -hmm. within these operations with some small strategies. So there's just a lot we can do in organic. And the reality is the organic farmer got lazy, just like conventional farmer, right? Making a lot of money, mm -hmm. forgetting about the, some of the services we have to offer the, the outdoor space as well. So, well, I want to ask more about that, but before we do, could you talk a little bit about what your tillage has been, say in this transition period? And uh, and if you if it's been effective or if you would change it, given your experience thus far, yeah. This, this um, so one we've done one pass during transition with a vertical till unit, and that's the, the only tillage pass we've made. Yeah. Um, but we've managed our weeds accordingly. Like we jumped in and did harvest a little earlier because we could store and put things on air. So we jumped in and did some harvest on weeds before they. You know, went to seed we had to had to save that process so there's decisions like that you have to make decisions based on what's going on in the field right it's not it's not as it's not as simple and i don't know conventional ag just looking at conventional ag being a part of it and again no disrespect but looking at conventional ag and looking at the level of management it takes it's just night and day difference you know it's you can you can you can say that conventional ag management it's becoming so much more reliant on technology than it is boots in the field, you know, and that's the difference with organic. You can, you can look at spatial data from any system you want on an organic farm, but you can't tell if your Canadian thistles are about to blow all over the, you know, 300 acres around you and right. cause huge issues right. for the next five years. Right. So yeah. you have to actually physically be present in that field to make decisions about how you manage it. And that's uh you know, that, that's really a, a big part of that weed management process, so. Yeah, no, that, that's that's really interesting to hear just a single tillage pass. And I think that's something that when folks consider the cost of organics and the, the you know, the myth that organics just loves tillage, I think it's, it's an expensive thing. It's time, steel, and money when we're doing tillage. And so however we can reduce that is a, a benefit to the operator. Um, I appreciate also when you said that despite technology's potential, we can uh, we can never really know what we need to do in management wise without boots on the ground. And I think that's something that excites me about organics is how much human capital we need to be running these farms. And I think when we say more labor, we also are meaning more community members, more folks needed to be on these farms, also keeping our rural communities alive. Um, another question that came in is, can you share one thing you're focusing on improving this season, 2022? Yeah, I, for sure. Right away, you know, this fall, we focused on the establishment of our small grain, which, you know, it just kind of took it for granted. No different than walking last year as I got like, ah, plant it, you know, we'll be OK. But I didn't take into account, you know, our, our timing. I wasn't as concerned with because we always have good growing conditions late into the fall. And it's like, all right, I don't need to worry about that as much. Well, it turns out I did. So, so that, that's a big what part if, of what we What changed. about those conditions were different than what you had assumed? Well, I mean, I, if you're just growing, if you're just growing something for a cover crop in conventional, like, like rye is a great example, right? You, you can put, you can dump rye on your, uh, on your shop floor and it'll germinate. Mm -hmm. And to us in the conventional side, in order to get that rye to be viable the next season, we just need germination, right? You don't need much growth out of that rye. But if you put that in a conventional system where you're, you're managing it at a higher, in, a higher intensity, you need a lot more than just germination of that, of that small grain. You need some actual green growth out of that small grain in the fall to give you enough advantage in the spring so that it outcompetes, you know, the conditions you're trying to, to, to compete against. And um, that comes down to 
you know, if, if my window for planting that is October 1st, October 15th, not planting it November 1st, because I think I can. It's just mm -hmm. getting the work done when it's supposed to be done, because you know your margin of error, you know, it, it changes with the deeper you go into your season and, and you just open yourself up and, and you're exposed. So, yeah, yeah. So our, our goal is to eliminate uh, the amount of exposure we have to risk. Uh, yeah, that really had a lot to do with planting that small grain in time. Sure. Yeah. When you cross that certified organic finish line, what do you kind of, and not necessarily specific crops, but what, what functional crops will you have in your crop rotation? How do you envision that working? I don't know. And that, you know, selfishly on that side of it is I don't have to know because I'm only a, a couple hundred acres of organic and I have that flexibility and I, I'll probably just experiment with things initially. You know, I would love to, you know, with, with the acreage I have, I would love to grow some heritage grains and, and do something unique from that standpoint uh, because I don't treat it as my primary revenue stream by any means. It's really, to me, it's about, uh, you know, transitioning my own land to organic was really because my dad is farming it. Even though I, you know, I go to the bank and sign the paperwork, I wasn't farming it. Mm -hmm. And I finally had got my dad to, you know, agree to do the work that we needed to do to transition it. And then I would be a part of that. So, you know, <clears throat> what happens after this is whatever makes it easy for us to manage. And I, I think it will be in the small grain space. It will be definitely in a space where we don't have to go out there and do cultivator pass after cultivator pass. We don't have to do tillage. So it keeps pushing me over these small grains in rotation. And I would, I, would, I don't know, I mean, I've even thought about doing some two row barley. I, I, I don't know. I, I think it would be interesting to do some things that haven't been grown around here in a long time, yep. strictly because it's been so densely populated with conventional ag and all you see is corn, you know, but I know what my grandpa used to grow back in the day. You know, I think we all know what the heritage used to grow. So it, it, it is possible. I mean, shoot, we can grow, I can grow 120 bushel oats around here. I mean, that that's a good that's a good yielding oat, but oats pay three dollars a bushel. So that's why they that's why no one grows oats. Right, right. So yeah, I think we'll grow some some unique things. I hope, I, I, but I'm really leaning towards small grains. In that small grain pursuit, do you envision that you'd be able to get to a point where you have a no-till system in the organics, or will you always have a period of no-till, just a little bit less than necessarily every year? I, I think if we do it right, we'll always be no-till. Okay. You know, so yeah. we're just continually mulching when we're in that no-till space. And it, if I come out of my small grain and I put in a, a, a four-way cover crop mix until I go plant my next small grain, that's a that's a pretty thick mat of biomass that that will help me with my my weed prevention strategy. It'll help me with my nutrient cycling strategy, my tillage strategy. I mean, essentially it's going to do everything I need it to do to keep my small grain in that rotating, you know, that that cycle. Uh, and even if I were to come into another crop after that, I'm still, I'm still putting out a lot of biomass and um, I'm still putting the diversity into the soil system. I'm creating a more, a more, more healthy soil environment. So I'm checking a lot of boxes with it. So yeah, I think, it, I think we'll be in good shape with that. Awesome. When will you start to bring on manure in preparation for cross and finish line into organics? So we, we bring on manure right now. It's okay. extremely hard to get. You know, yeah. I think last year I had manure bought and never received it. Mm. You know, it was just such so, so short. And I it was $175 a ton delivered to the farm. And it's like, man, that's that's a lot of money for manure. But I was used to purchasing it for $35. And the reality is, is that prices go up when things become short. Uh, so we're, we're integrating it as we can. Um, but I also bought expensive organic nitrogen last year you know, because I didn't have manure. So, um, right. yeah, we, we just, you know, manure for us, though, will never, you know, the goal with it is not to go over a ton per acre sure. with our operation. So, yeah, I want to encourage everyone on the call to um, open your mics and ask questions if you have them or put them right into the chat. We're nearing the top of the hour. So I want to make sure any questions you all have. Um, can be tossed to Ben and get a little bit of insight on it from his expertise. So is everyone on the call from this Midwest or is it all over the place? It's going to be all over the place. Okay. Yeah. 
So it's really the idea is having this, um, uh, OATS is a national consortium, yeah. um, sort of Idaho all the way to Pennsylvania and, uh, and everybody coming from, from everywhere in between. Um, when you're looking at, I, I really appreciated how you described regenerative and organics relationship. Um, I think that's a point of confusion. I, regenerative is sort of a wild west term right now uh, with everybody deciding how they want to define it. But, um, but when you think about these regenerative practices that we're bringing into organic, um, could you just expand on that a little bit of, of these ecosystem services that you might consider um, when planning a rotation or trying to articulate to a landlord or to someone else why organics is the way to go beyond just necessarily the profit margin? Yeah, I think the, the key thing that we look at is, you know, when you're not in this part of Illinois or, or this part of the country where it's, you know, flat, dark, square soils, uh, mm -hmm. and we look at areas of fields that aren't as productive, we look at water movement, we look at, um, we do, I, I personally do a full terrain analysis, and this is getting outside of like my farming work, but when we look at organic operations, we do a full terrain analysis. We look for parts of that, that opportunity that, that we can identify as, you know, low or no production opportunities. Uh, we will mm -hmm. look at these as, you know, areas where water moves off field or water just moves internally within these parcels and what happens to water management, what happens to areas of that field where there's, uh, you know, highly erodible land that we can't farm from a tillage standpoint. Uh, so we look at areas like that for those ecosystem services. So what can we do to enhance buffering around water management? pathways, what can we do to enhance uh, habitat on areas that don't have productivity potential that's worth it for us? So, uh, you know, the further west we get, the, the more we find some areas that, you know, if it's 40 bushel wheat, great. If it's 10 bushel wheat, we might as well turn it into a habitat and um, generate some ecosystem credit from that, from that process. So, so we look at it from that standpoint, but we also look at um, you know, the, the livestock piece has been kind of the hot topic with regenerative side of it. And I think that's what will always hold, you know, my family runs a livestock operation, but. Oh, they do. Okay. Yeah. Well, the, another, you know, my cousin runs the livestock and some row crop side and, and a, a bigger livestock operation, but actually getting that livestock into a rotation to fully optimize your regenerative systems is that's a completely different animal that I don't know that I'll ever tackle. Yeah. Uh, but we're going to bring those regenerative systems in primarily as reductions in tillage, uh, you know, as aggressive as we can be on cover crop use. So we're going to constantly promote those and get those in whenever and wherever we can. And, uh, you know, the, the compost, the reductions in manure usage also, I think as we look at organic, we're going to see reductions in manure usage count towards regenerative credits because it's, I, I don't think we really understand how big of a problem manure use in organics is. Uh, mm -hmm. So we'll look at it from that angle as well. But yeah, I mean, there's, there's just ample opportunity to integrate these systems if we look at them from that lens. The problem is we usually only look at it from yield and, and revenue. Sure. Yeah. No, I, that, that's, I really appreciate that insight. Towards the end here, I want to ask kind of a higher level question. And that is, if we're importing, say, 25% of the organic corn used in the US and a bunch more than that of the soybeans. It seems like there's really ripe opportunities for folks to be jumping into the organic system, organic game. What do you see as the barrier to, as an advisor and an organic farmer yourself or, or transitioning farmer yourself, what is holding folks back from stepping in and claiming this market space? Yeah, I think it's, uh, the fear of the unknown for the farmer, right? It's fear of it's a fear of failing again because farmers have all. all I think I would say almost every farmer has had a, a harder road at some point of, mm -hmm. of the you know almost failing at something they've done, and now they likely have a system that they're really comfortable with. It generates revenue and it works. And um, just because there's more revenue over there doesn't mean you'll be successful at it. And that that prohibits a lot of people and it's just a mental block but it prohibits a lot of people from entering that space but there is a real issue with access to capital 
Uh, you know, especially for younger farmers and, and uh, new farmers, like early generation farmers that don't have that, you know, they don't have that old money to lean back on or that those old assets to lean back on. Uh, I think, we're, but we're seeing an infusion of capital into this space, right? If you can prove that you have the ability, you can get some capital and, and you can get some support to, to put these farming practices in place. Um, but it, it, from an agronomy standpoint, there, there's a void. I mentioned this in the video. There's a void in support from an agronomy standpoint in organics. And there's a massive opportunity for, for agronomists to step up into the space and not just, you know, not just tote the leadership hat, but actually bring substance to that, bring a practical process to how to support organic farmers in your region. And, um, you know, it, it comes down to education and engagement. So if you do that, you are the advisor, you are the person responsible for bringing education to the farm, like it or not. That's why, you know, that's why the ASA brings continuing education to the advisors is then those advisors pass that education to their customer base. So the same thing applies in this organic process, you know, learn about it, understand it. It's a fundamental process of agriculture. It's more fundamental. You know, there's more fundamentals in organics than there are in conventionals because these fundamentals are foundations of a system. And um, the more you learn about the connection between those fundamentals and how they apply to food production, how they apply to nutrition, uh, the easier it is to have a conversation with a farmer, regardless of their opinion on organics, it just becomes easier to have an, an, an engaging conversation with a farmer and, and start that education process. And I think that's where 99% of the issues we face are because we uh, we don't confront those issues. They become bigger issues and they they remain issues. But if we if we engage and we educate the base, I think we'll be in good shape. And if I hear you, it's good farming is good farming, whether conventional or organic. Oh, for sure, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, you, you could look at this organic industry from a, from a producer standpoint. And you'll find just as many violations against climate and, you know, in the organic space, it's not any different. You still have bad farmers, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, have bad practices in, in both fields. I, my goal professionally is to clean that up. We're trying to bring these regenerative services at scale into the organic space. I think we're going to do that very aggressively here moving forward, but I'm not anti-conventional, you know, I'm, I'm just someone that wants to see farmers move the needle because they have all that potential to move the needle on, on some of these, you know, issues that are in the front of us all the time, you know, climate, conventional farmers have, you're going to have every major ag company in the world hopping on their farmer base saying they're all good, but the reality is they're not, you know, farmers have a lot to change in the conventional space. We're just talking organic and there's a ton to change over here, but once you start creeping closer to that regenerative space, how far away are you from organic? I mean, you're not that far from it when you're doing exactly. regenerative systems. I wish we could have a whole nother conversation about that. I know, that. there's a lot to go through. <laughs> there is. There is a lot of folks are really close to going organics. And I think that your point about advisors and folks who know what that connector, what that last bridge to cross is between conventional and organic to get folks comfortable with organic is so essential. Yeah. Oats was founded to ultimately be a, a trainer of advisors. And so we've got this um, organic field crop course coming out in the summer. And um, and for those of you um, who are, are keeping up with those, please watch our emails for that because it's going to be a really exciting time, hopefully, to get more folks trained, just like you're saying, Ben, um, and get them in the field talking to farmers, figuring out these solutions to get more acres transitioned in a way that actually makes farms whole that we're not just taking a lot of the same problems from conventional and moving it to organic, but rather realizing a different system that makes farmers keep that margin, protect those resources, help that soil. And I think all of those things are, are it's a big lift and it's gonna take us all, but it's really, like you're saying, quite exciting. Yeah, and I mean, there's NOP, they, didn't the NOP um, standards board just release an education series as well through I, think, I, I thought I saw some NOP education opportunities available. They did, yes. The Organic Integrity yeah. Learning Center is just yeah, yeah, pumping yeah. out courses. And yeah. they're really good. There are some brilliant folks doing that work. Um, yeah. Oates is, is working on one right now as well. Um, yeah. Well, it takes, it takes the education piece. And, and, you know, regretfully, that's where I'm not currently a CCA because 
I wasn't getting educated in that field from the organization, and I know they have the potential to make some massive changes, and I, I'm eager to see it happen. Uh, and maybe at some point I'll get my CCA back in, a, in action, but it, it takes education for this process to take hold and, and um, really change, change these outcomes. Couldn't agree more. Yep. Well, Ben, thank you. This has been really a wonderful conversation. I appreciate your time and appreciate you making the video. Um, Oats is also going to be launching um, over the next couple of months, some really exciting projects. So I want to tell everyone, watch your email. And then while we are working on this hybrid course that's going to be launching this summer, Oats also does custom training. So if you have an organization or a company that's interested in getting your folks off uh, off and running with organic education. Um, Oats has worked with different companies around the country, building out curriculum specific to regions, specific to crops, specific to companies' needs. Um, so please contact Mallory or Oats in general for more information. And lastly, save the date for our next organic advisor call. It's going to be February 23rd at 8 a.m. Central with Charlie Johnson from Madison, South Dakota. And we'll be talking about diversity in crop rotations and the importance of organic agriculture to rural communities. So again, thank you so much, Ben. And anybody who has any more questions, please feel free to contact us. But really want to thank everyone for your time this morning and hope you're staying warm out there, wherever you are in the country. Thank you. All right, appreciate it, Ben. Take care. Thanks, everybody.